this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. Morning. And happy Sunday after Easter. I'm so glad you all are here this morning. This is a place where everyone is welcome. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone. Because I am welcome here. You are welcome here. We are welcome here. Amen and hallelujah. Indeed, no matter who you are or where you are on your life journey, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, special word of welcome. Hope you grabbed one of those gift bags out in the narthex. There's a little card in that gift bag, and if you sign in on that and give us your email address, we'll make sure that you stay up to date on all the activities here at University Christian Church. At the end of each row, I think the far end, there is an attendance pad. If you wouldn't mind taking that out and signing in on that this morning, we'd really appreciate it. Coffee chat will be held after worship. It is not raining today, so we'll be back out in the courtyard. Wasn't that fun last week? You have little portable communion cups that we will use later in worship on your chairs. If you don't mind, after worship, hanging on to those and placing those in the recycling bin out in the lobby, we'd appreciate it. If you forget, no worries at all, not a big deal. We are looking for some more children's ministry volunteers. If someone is interested in uh, volunteering with the children's ministry, we'll need to, uh, we would love for you to talk to Pastor Marcella or to Lenore. Lenore is out today, so we're especially grateful for our children's ministry volunteers today. If you would like to be a greeter, we're looking for a few more folks to welcome everyone as they're coming into church in the morning. And so if you would like to help with that, please talk with Leah Townsend, our church administrator. Thanks to all of you who brought items today for Blessings Beyond Borders to help those in shelters in Tijuana and those who brought items for Uptown Community Service Center. We're so grateful for that. Uptown Community Service Center was actually founded here at University Christian Church in 1983, and they're getting ready for their yearly gala, which raises the majority of the funds that they use to operate throughout the year. So if you'd like to help uh, support that, that is going to be on Saturday, April 13th. I think this coming Saturday at 4.30. And you can see Melanie Simone for uh, tickets for that. Today after worship, let's talk about it. Ableism with Emily and Lucia. I, I think, right, Emily and Lucia, are you here? They're here, okay, it's going to be today after worship in the break room, which is through those doors to your left. Disciples Women Group 2 will be meeting tomorrow at 6 in the church office. We're having a National Faith and Climate Forum on the 16th of April. We're participating in a, a national event, and we are the Southern California location. We'll send out more information on that very soon. And there is a ton of other stuff coming up. And we'd invite you to check out the epistle for that. Today is the first Sunday of the month. And we usually do Celebration Sunday on the last Sunday of the month. But it was Easter and it was a busy day. And it was too much to do Celebration Sunday last week. So we're going to do it today. If you have things that you want to celebrate, I'd invite you to come forward and share them. And as you're coming forward, think about the 30 second or less way that you're going to share the good things that are going on in your life right now. We don't need to hear about your grandma's possum pie or about the ditch you accidentally drove your car into this week. But what we do need to hear about is the 30 second or less way that you are celebrating something good in your life right now. Starting with Michael. Good morning, church. I'm celebrating that last week I retired from the county. Uh, and this past January, my dad turned uh, 99, and I turned 64. Uh, I'm celebrating my birthday. Who knew that 23 years ago yesterday, a kiss would start all this? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, my birthday is on the 10th, and I'm turning 27. My birthday was on the 25th of March. On the 1st of April, I celebrated 50 years of being out of the Air Force. Wow. I'm going to change the pace here a bit. So, today is Orthodox Easter Sunday. So, I'm wishing you all happy Easter. Now, I'm going to backtrack a bit. In March, I had two mm, kind of minor, moderate floods in my apartment. The second one was on Good Friday. And there I was. The plumber came at 7 o'clock. It was on him and his problem. So I was drying out last weekend, literally. I wasn't underwater. I wasn't over my head, but I was behind the eight ball, okay? So... I did all the um, necessary things to prepare the place for my two friends that joined us. You'll meet them later, Jude and Sophie. And um, they're staying with me through the rest of this week. So we're celebrating them here at church. Thank you. I celebrated a big birthday last Wednesday, the 27th. I'm celebrating, announcing, so happy about. We're going to have two little grandbabies in our lives before too long, besides our three year, almost three year old little fella, Elliot. So, our daughter in law and son are expecting their first on July 24th, a girl. And then our daughter and her husband are expecting number two on September 7th. So, I'm going to go home and catch up on my sleep. Good morning, my name is Adam, and I'm celebrating my eighth month in the choir. And as you know, I'm looking forward to moving on the 15th of this month, and I'm hoping that the building will be available because they've had three setbacks already. So just pray for me that the building will be available on the 15th so I don't have to cancel the movers. Thank you. Good morning. As you know, I monitor our digital congregation, and I just wanted to share one um, from Frankie Medavog. He is celebrating 40 months being sober today. So congratulations, Frankie. It's a big deal. Let's sing congratulations to you. Give them another round of applause. Congratulations to all of you. We're glad to celebrate with you. Thank you, Peggy, for the goodies today. And thanks to all of you for being here. You know, the Sunday after Easter is historically a low Sunday. That means that people have figured they've been religious enough with all the Easter stuff and don't always come on the Sunday after Easter. So I'm glad that all of you are here this morning. If you're here in the sanctuary or you're online, we appreciate you. Friends, let's turn our focus now towards worship. May the peace of Christ be always with you. I invite you to stand up and exchange a sign of peace and greeting with all those around you. Friends, I hope as you're returning to your seats, you'll remain standing and let's get to singing together. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to University Christian Church. Put your hands together. In the Bible, fire is often used to symbolize zeal and excitement. And I don't know about you, but it sometimes gets a little boring maybe doing the right thing. 
So there's a term that says revival, and all that means is, God, bring back the excitement of coming to church, of doing the right thing, of seeking justice, of seeking your will on the earth. So we're going to sing about that this morning. Sing with me. It says, fire, fire, fall on us. Start a new revival. Say fire, 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 fall on us. Start a new revival, fire, fall on like it did on the day of Pentecost, like it did on the day of Pentecost, rushing in like a mighty wind. Fill us up with your presence and your power. So sing fire, let me hear you say. this overwhelmed by your glory and your grace you consume us with your love give us more and more of who because why because we can so if you believe it let me you sing would say with an uplifted hand, at some point in my life, God has done something for me. God's people have helped me. Well, you know what? If God did it once, God can do it again. So sometimes I have to remind myself when I get in one of those situations, wait a minute, God has brought me through stuff before, so whatever this mountain is I'm facing, whatever this sea is that I'm ready to cross, God can do it again. So I like this, just say this. Well, just like you did it before, Lord, we're ready. Lord, we are ready. Sing that with me. Just like you did it. Just like you did it before. What? Lord, we are ready for more. Well, just like, just like you did it before. Lord, we are ready. Lord, we are ready. You did it before. Just, just like you did it before. God, we are ready. Lord, we are ready for more. Who remembers these characters? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says they were thrown into a fiery pit, and yet God delivered them out of the fire. Daniel in the lions, did it had anybody try to attack you verbally, talk about you? Well, guess what? If God can deliver Daniel, if God can deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, turn and tell somebody, God can deliver you. Come on, turn and tell someone, God can deliver you. Just like you did it be. Oh, Lord, Lord, we are ready. Just like you did it. Come on, church, let me hear you. Just like you did it before. God, we are ready. I know you can do it again. Just like we did it before. Come on. Everybody say fire. 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 Fall on us. Start a new. since that was new can we go old school no I mean old school <laughs> this song um, there's a couple of them I want to say one thing about our church when I was a kid we sang I'll fly away and our church taught that one day Jesus is gonna like come halfway down a trumpet's gonna sound and then we're all gonna disappear planes are gonna crash cars are gonna I mean we were, there were movies about this anyone remember that 
Well, I don't believe that anymore, but I still sing the song because I have been in situations in my life where I want to fly out. And I believe that God can take us to a better day, that our nation can come to a day of more justice and more equality and more fairness. And so symbolically, metaphorically, when I sing these songs, they don't have a literal meaning. They have the meaning that God has taken us to a better day. God is going to take us to a more just place. So if you remember this song that says, Some glad morning when this life is over, Oh, to a home, home on God's celestial shore. I'll oh, come on, everybody, say, I'll find a way, oh, glory. I'll find a way. And when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll find a way. Well, just a few more. Weary days and then to a land, to a land where joy shall never end. I will I'll fly. Come on, sing it like you mean it. Well, oh glory, I die. is old also, recorded by all kinds of countries people. Who knows this? Well, I wandered so aimless, darkness within. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord. I saw Let me hear you say. Come on, put your hands together. Sing verse two with me. Well, just like the blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears, no claim for mine. Then like the blind man, God gave back. And what did he say? One more time, come on, let's raise the roof. I saw the light, yes I did. I saw the light. We'll go more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, sorrow. Let me hear it. Praise the Lord, I saw the Friends, will you pray with me? Holy and life-giving God, we have entered your courts with thanksgiving and praise. May this praise inspire us to do good works in the world and to be loving beacons of your light. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. And R.C., would you like to introduce us to the newest member of the, of the team up there? So uh, for several years now, we have wanted to find an accompanist. The music ministry has grown. Uh, the choir is quite large. And I'm over here at the piano throwing my head around and my hands around. Uh, we looked, and we are so, so fortunate. William Ossing is a tremendous musician. He plays accompanies with the Gay Men's Chorus. Uh, a fabulous musician. I, I told him I had hoped the best we might fight someone who was classical, who could read the anthems, but wouldn't understand our gospel and country. He has it all. Has it all. So, Will, it's, it's awesome to have you here today. Thank you. Welcome to the team. Glad you're here. And will the children please come forward?
Well, we are grateful that all of you are here today, and we're also grateful for Jamie and Joy, who are our children's volunteers today, especially since Ms. Lenore is out today. Thank you all for volunteering your time. We at University Christian Church like to send our children out with a blessing. So if you're comfortable, I ask you to extend your arms as we bless our children. Holy One, we give you thanks for your light and your love that we see through the lives of these children. May your light, your love shine brightly through them. May they care about others. May they love one another. And may your love be manifest through them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You all can go with Joy and Jamie. And have a great time. teach a song. We did it once before, but it was a long time ago, and I locked this song because of some of you, how many of you grew up in the church? So this is a new song, but it uses a lot of titles. Maybe through it you can guess, try to find out how many hymns are mentioned in this, uh, this song. And I remember those melodies words we sang when I first believed, songs of redemption, stories of hope, heaven awakened inside my soul, and I sing in Christ alone, my solid ground. sound that rugged cross Jesus paid it all because he lives this is my peace like a river love so divine those words kept singing through my darkest night, sweet hymns of freedom, anthems of praise, remind my heart to trust His name. Christ alone, yes it is. Again, this is my story. This is my story. This is my. I'm praising my Savior. My Savior. All the day long. And assurance. Glory divine. Oh, hallelujah. Gee, last 
last time. Come on. In Christ alone. Where in Christ alone. Yes, it is. My solid morning church family to those here in the building and those online right now it is time to rest in God's presence and pray for our community and our community at large we pray for former for the family of former member and former UCC treasurer John Thompson he passed away in the early morning hours of April 1st he was 73 and is survived by his wife, Susan, two children, and four grandchildren. We also pray for Wendy Svensson's cousin's family, Kelsey. We prayed for them last week. Kelsey passed away last Sunday evening. He was 75 and is survived by his wife and son. We also pray for Sue Berillion, who is home with Vertigo today. Sue also um, recently had a job switch, and we are praying that that goes well. Let's remember all those who are in long-term recovery, Juliana Damasis, as well as her husband, John Hansen, Stan Gaines, Don Rowe, Brent Criswell, Jim Chafee, Maggie Galvan, Lupita Haley, Kiko Galvan, Patrick Haggerty, Beverly Williams, Patty Gilchrist, Victoria and Cameron Reed, Sarah Kovach, Mark Alvira, and Tina Yazi. May we continue to remember those in need of prayer, Sue Chacon, Patrick Haggerty, Sharon Fields' parents, Rip Ripito's father, as well as Michael Dobbins' father, R.C. House's parents, Diego Salazar Galvis, Marion Reed, Marilyn Trockman, Michelle Myers, Sylvia Bracewell, Janet Fox, Kiki Valdez's family, Ruth Mitchell, Daniel Woodward, Larry Wilter's family, and Lisa Kovach. Let us remember and pray for the victims of war and violence around the world, for those in our community seeking employment and those in difficult job situations, for those struggling to make ends meet and those seeking shelter and housing, for those struggling with physical and mental health issues and those who are caring for them, and for all those who are grieving. Friends, I invite you to share your prayer requests either silently or out loud or in the comment section of our live stream. We will end our time of prayer by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. I will begin with our Creator, but as always, please feel free to use whatever language is most comfortable to you. Let us pray. everlasting God of life and love. You are our beginning and our end. You are the deep well of love that satisfies our deepest need for belonging. In you, we live and move and have our being. In you, we find companionship. Your spirit lives and dwells among and within us. You desire every goodness for us, your children. We ask you continue to form us in grace, to recreate us in love, that we may desire every goodness for our neighbors, as you desire every blessing for us all. Knowing your steadfast love and your desire for the entirety of creation, knowing that you are merciful, just, and compassionate, we can bring every concern to you. For those who hunger, bring relief. We pray for food and the communal desire for change so that those that are hungry and at risk of starvation be fed. We pray for justice for those who await and receive court decisions which impact their ability to live and thrive as the people you created them to be. 
Restore checks and balances where those in power have overstepped. Renew our commitment to use our knowledge for the flourishing of humanity and your creation. We cry out to you, O God, for an end to war and violence. Send your helpers to tend to the trauma of all violence. When we hear the news daily, we cannot help but cry out, How long, O God? How long until the tools of war are surrendered? We pray for your love and grace to transform hearts and to create communities of peace where all are welcome. We hold close in our hearts those who endure chronic illness and pain, shocking diagnoses, multiple surgeries, and accidents. May your faithful presence make a way for strength, comfort, and healing as we long for the day when pain will be no more. Everlasting God of life and love, you are our beginning and our end. As you continue to bring your vision of this world into reality, inspire us to lifelong discipleship, a commitment to love without reservation as you command. By your spirit, guide us to follow the way of Jesus, who teaches us to pray, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God sent a son Oh 
You know, throughout Jesus' life, one of his most consistent practices was sitting down at the table to eat with other people. And as I've mentioned so many times, it was often with people he wasn't supposed to be eating with. What you may not know is that after Jesus had been crucified, his disciples continued to meet, but they didn't celebrate this meal as we know it now. Instead, in that world, there was this, this tradition of gathering for meals in an upper room. That wasn't just something that happened like on Passover. That was something they did frequently. And if you were a part of the Greco-Roman world, you would have a meal, and then you would sit down, and you would talk about some philosophy, some idea that a philosopher had presented. But Jesus' followers, they continued that practice, but they talked instead about Jesus. So scholars think that for the first century or so that early Christians gathered, they just had a normal meal. And Jesus was so fresh in their memory that whenever they ate, they thought of those meals that he was sharing with others. As that practice became less common, they formalized the meal as a symbolic meal so that they could continue that meal practice even when they weren't gathering in upper rooms anymore. And so that tradition has carried on to worship here where we have these symbolic elements. But you know, the way the earliest Christians celebrated this meal is also true, right? That every time we gather together, every time we share a meal, that is a communion practice. That every time we are eating, we are eating food that is sacred food that we are lucky to have, food that Christ is present in the midst of, and food that we are called to share. And so we gather around this table today recognizing that Christ is present with us in this meal and in all meals we share. It is in that spirit that we remember that on that night long ago, Jesus shared that meal with his disciples, and he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you. Take this, eat it, and remember me. And in the same way, also after supper, Jesus took a cup. And he said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. Take this, drink it, and remember me. Friends, as often as we eat of this bread, and as often as we drink from this cup, we proclaim Jesus' life, we proclaim his death, and we proclaim the hope that he gave us for the future. These are the gifts of God, and absolutely everyone is welcome. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in unity and reverence. We thank you for the gift of communion and the bond we share in our faith. May we always remember that we are not alone. May our love for you and each other draw us closer together. Guide us in our faith journey and help us remain humble and accepting of one another. Keep us in your loving embrace and let your power flow through each of us so that our unity can be a source of strength for all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Friends, the table has been set and all has been made ready. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. For this is not University Christian Church's table, it is Christ's table and it is open to all. So friends, I invite you to take those little communion cups you may notice we've got the other ones this week, and that's because we need to use all these up before they expire. And then we'll switch to those nice little chalice ones that have bread on one side and juice on the other. Friends, I invite you to open those up 
and hear these words. This is the bread of life, and it is for you. And this is the cup of love. Thanks be to God. Jesus teaches us to care for everyone in our community, but especially those who are less fortunate. At UCC, one of the ways we do this is partnering with Uptown Community Service Center. The center provides services to homeless, poor, and needy persons in a manner that is respectful and inclusive of all. We also send items to a shelter in Tijuana and reach out to people in the community through things like the Monday Thursday service. Your donation of time, talents, and tithes makes it possible for all of these awesome works to continue. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you with our hearts filled with gratitude for the abundant blessings you give us each day. We acknowledge that cheerful giving is not an obligation, but a joyful act of worship. Help us understand that our giving is an expression of our deep love for you and your and our desire to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's stand and sing together. Friends, you may be seated.
Good morning, church. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were sitting at the table. And he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And those signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will hurt them. They will lay their hands on the, stick, on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up to the heaven and sat, down, sat at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that accompanied it. Here ends the reading of the words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom for courage and interpretation. Friends, this Lent, we explored who killed Jesus. But we gathered 16 suspects as we retraced the events of Holy Week in a special six-week podcast. And with your help, we discovered who really killed Jesus. This podcast was a production of ProgressiveChristianity.org. Give yourselves a round of applause. Friends, I'm Caleb Lines. And I'm Marcella Salgado. And this is Who Killed Jesus, a true crime podcast, episode six and a half, a follow-up. <laughs> so friends, we did this podcast throughout Lent as a way we hope to, to help you think about the book we were reading in small groups called The Last Week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan, but also as a, a way for all of us to understand a little bit better the events of Holy Week, at least as described in the Gospel of Mark. And so we knew that there were some lingering questions about the book and about the podcast, and so we thought it might be kind of fun on this Sunday after Easter to do a podcast style sermon together. Yes. Does that sound good, Marshall? It sounds good. Okay. Sounds you all up for that too? <laughs> okay. Good. We'll we'll keep it pretty short, but we want to address some of the questions. So just a reminder of what happened during the events of Holy Week. 
So it begins on Palm Sunday, where in the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus entering on one side of town and Pontius Pilate on the other side of town. And Jesus stages a kind of anti-imperial protest, a, a parade that marks a difference between the imperialism of Rome. Instead, we see loyalty to the reign of God that is made manifest through the actions of justice and peace. Then on Holy Monday, Jesus and his disciples go into the temple and as an affront to the purity system that divided people into social classes and as a way to call out the religious leaders who were colluding with Rome, those who were complicit with Roman power, they, they staged this anti-temple protest where Jesus overturns the money changers' tables. Then on what we dubbed Teaching Tuesday, Jesus goes out into the courtyard and he gives some more parables, teachings that act as kind of an affront to the religious establishment. Then on what we called Woman's Wednesday, a woman anoints Jesus' head in the home of a leper. So a, a marginalized person names Jesus as the clearest manifestation of God in the home of someone who is ritually impure. Monday Thursday, we're familiar with. Jesus has a meal with his disciples, uh, likely a, a Passover meal, but different than the Passover meals that we know today. If you'd like to read more about that, you might check out um, a scholar named Mike Graves' book called Table Talk. And on Good Friday, Jesus is crucified for sedition. Silent Saturday, we get silence from Jesus. And uh, traditionally, that's called the harrowing of hell. But as we talked about in the podcast, that's a, a later development that Jesus likely didn't believe in hell. And he didn't use that word. He used the word Gehenna in the New Testament. And then on Easter Sunday, we see the women going to anoint the body in the tomb and discovering an empty tomb. And in Mark's gospel, the original version does not include the verses we just heard but ends with the women running away scared. So that is a quick and dirty rundown of what happened during Holy Week. And Marcella, we gathered 16 suspects All on our right board. right here, yes. Our 16 sus suspects, which we talked about every week during the podcast, but just to remind everybody, first up we have the Roman Empire. Of course, they were the ones in control. They were the government of the time. We have Pilate, who had come in, to um to just watch watch what was happening during the the time of passover um which was a tradition that he had they they would always come in and make sure that people wouldn't uprise during that time and during their celebrations um the sanhedrin which we know is like a jewish council and so there were some of the jewish leaders made up of some of the religious leaders and some of the very wealthy families of the time Jews, of course, we hear that a lot. Um, the Jews get blamed for being the ones who crucified Jesus. Sadducees and Pharisees, which were two religious leaders, uh, groups of leaders at the time, and they were the ones that Jesus uh, went back and forth with on Teaching Tuesday. We also have original sin. So we've heard this a lot, right? The original sin, Adam and Eve, if that had never happened, then there would be no reason for the cross. Uh, we have God, God, which ties into original sin. It was God's plan for Jesus to die, right? Then we also had a suggestion, the Republican Party, which uh, continues to crucify Jesus today. And Caleb had brought up just U.S. politics in general. Um, my personal favorite, my personal sin, the sin of, you know, I was just born a sinful creature, you were born a sinful creature, and hence that is why Jesus had to die on the cross. Then we also had a lovely suggestion by somebody I love that Courtney Love had something to do with Jesus' death. <laughs> we threw it in there because Marcella is adamant that they need to reopen Kurt Cobain's murder case and really look into other suspects. <laughs> Then, of course, Judas. We know the story of Judas who betrayed Jesus and told them where Jesus was going to be the night that he was arrested. 
We also have greed, which also ties into Judas, but our own greed, Judas's greed, he might be symbolic of the greed. He wanted money, some suggest. Um, and then the disciples. We don't hear that one a lot, but it is very much worth thinking about the disciples. Where were they during all of this? And Caiaphas, which is also a name you don't hear very often, but Caiaphas was one of the leaders at the time. And then the Roman Emperor Tiberius, which ties back into the Roman Empire as a whole. So where did we land with? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of suspects to talk about. And to, to be fair, most of these we didn't come up with ourselves. We threw this out on social media and said, who do you think killed Jesus? And we got a lot of, well, it's very clear who killed Jesus. Why are you even talking about this? And then they went on to list someone different, something different than the person in the comment ahead of them, right? Who had said something similar. So it's interesting because people have a lot of very strongly held beliefs uh, about this. And so we went through and over the course of the podcast talked about why, uh, why each of these forces may or may not have been at play. But where we landed was that crucifixion is a Roman form of death, right? And so it was Pontius Pilate on behalf of Emperor Tiberius and the Empire with the complicity of those who were colluding with Rome. And I think, Marcello, that's something that I learned maybe in, in a renewed way talking about this again, was that there were people who were in either religious or political local authority who had a lot at stake in staying in power, uh, but they were also in a difficult position. Very difficult position. They were, especially like a, a lot of the Jewish leaders were mm -hmm. trying to toe that line where they wanted to protect yeah. the Jewish community and, um, you know, you kind of had to play the game also with and, and go along with, with Rome and what Rome wanted, you know, and that's mm. keeping the peace. Make sure people weren't going to uprise, weren't going to ruffle any feathers. So it was, so there was part of wanting to stay in power and, and there was part of wanting to protect the people and it was a delicate balance. And so people like Caiaphas, the high priest, had a, had a really tight wrote that they had to walk, a really fine line they had to walk, or, or else if they made the Romans too mad, uh, it might not just be one person who was crucified, it, it might be a whole, a whole group of people. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to say, though, that this whole notion that it was the Jews who crucified Jesus is completely unfounded. I mean, as we talked about, Jesus and all of his early followers were Jewish. So it wasn't the Jews who crucified Jesus. And the whole notion um, that the Jews could force the Romans to do anything is actually really ludicrous. I mean, an oppressed people telling the empire what to do is, is ridiculous. But that's the thing that I got most on social media was like, well, it's, it's the Jewish people yeah. uh, crucified Jesus. Yeah. And that's historically inaccurate, and it has led to centuries of anti-Semitism. But I think it's also important to say that one of the reasons for that is because the Gospel of John, which was written like 60 years or more after Jesus' crucifixion, was written at a time where the early Christian community was leaving the synagogue. And so the Gospel of John loses the distinction between those groups you were talking about, Marcella, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and lumps everybody together. Because at, at that point in time, Christianity was developing as a separate movement. Uh, but that wasn't uh, original to the, uh, the intent. Very good. So I, I think it's important to, uh, to draw out that distinction. What do, you, what do you think about the notion of, say, original sin? Oh, well, original, I mean, I don't believe in it. <laughs> so I think um, that is something that, that I grew up hearing a lot. I think it's what a lot of churches still continue to preach, you know, that we are born into sinful nature. Um, and that's also unfounded. Like God made us beautiful. Like we hear over and over again that, you know, God created us beautiful and wonderful. Um, do I believe that evil exists? Of course. We are all capable of being hurtful and evil. We are all capable of probably the most heinous of crimes. I am a true crime podcast 
junky. Yes. Um, and part of that is that fascination that we are all capable of, of, of evil. But original sin, no, I just, I don't understand it. How, why would God, and then also why would God need to redeem us by killing God's own son? Like it just, none of that makes sense to me. Yeah, and I think it's important. This is one of the things that, that I think really illustrates why it's important to know how theology developed. Because if Jesus were hanging on the cross and someone came up to him and said, thank you for dying for the sins of Adam so that I'm not marred by original sin, he would have no idea what you were talking about because that idea hadn't been invented yet. It wasn't invented for centuries until Augustine came through and read that back into it. So I think it's important to know the history of theology because, uh, you know, if, if you choose to believe those things, you know you can choose to believe whatever you, whatever you want, but I think that it's important to know that Jesus wouldn't have even heard of that concept. Well, and I think tied into that is also this idea of the cross. You know, we have crosses as symbols and um, we wear them and it is a symbol of something that was important, an important event, right, for us as Christians. But the cross at the time was Rome's form of executing anybody who stood up against government. So a thief would not have been crucified on a cross. They would have been killed in a different manner. The cross was a very clear sign that um, somebody was standing up against empire and speaking up against the government. So Jesus dying on the cross was a very clear uh, way of them saying, this person's ruffling feathers, this person is questioning us, and this person is going to cause a revolution. There was fear in that. So I think that's an important point to remember, too. Um, going back to, you know, Jesus hanging on the cross for our sins. It, it was very clearly an execution because of who, what he was saying and, and because of the followers he had. That's a good point, Marcella. And I think one thing that I forgot uh, or, or didn't think about a lot was that the Romans would leave the vertical posts outside of cities and as a, a sign that if you spoke out against Rome, that you could be crucified. And sometimes when you would go into the city, you would see people hanging on the cross there as a visual reminder. But even if there weren't people hanging on the cross, the vertical pole was still there. And people would carry the cross beam, the horizontal beam, uh, to the cross to, to, to be crucified. So I, I think the other notion that's tied into that is the whole thought of Jesus dying for sins. Um, so you said you don't, you don't like the idea of original sin. How do you feel about the idea of Jesus dying for personal sin? Because you said that that was something you heard a lot growing up, was that Jesus died for your personal sin. Yes, I did hear that a lot. And in the book that we read the last week, um, there was some, some better explanation for that. I mean, I, I had let go of that theology when I was, um, I mean, I think before I, I hit college, but in college as I was studying and learning from my professors, um, I learned to let go of that because of the, you know, just learning the historical evolution of Christianity yeah. and how that idea was brought in later. Uh, but they describe it in the book that, you know, it, it, even this idea, we try to equate it as like, you know, back in the Old Testament times, you know, the, the Jewish community had to sacrifice a lamb or sacrifice a dove or some sort of animal. And so Jesus is that ultimate sacrifice. And um, Borg and Crossan explained that that's not so. You would explain it so much better than I would because I will take 20 minutes. To <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I think, I think the, the important thing to realize is that there are multiple theologies presented in the Gospels. And I think uh, uh, Borg and Crossan acknowledge that atonement is one theology that is presented in the Bible, but not the only theology that's presented in the Bible. And it, it seems to have been a later development and, and not what, uh, what Jesus was, was actually originally theologically doing. Or at least I think we can say that it's clear that Jesus was crucified by the Roman Empire for speaking an anti-imperial message. That's the only reason that Ro Romans crucified people. The only reason. Uh, the Jewish leaders didn't put Jesus to death because if they had, it would have been death by stoning and not crucifixion. So 
any theologizing beyond Jesus standing up to empire is something that people were doing after his death to make sense of it themselves. So it's not a theology that Jesus gave. It is a theology that his followers gave afterward. So, so if you believe that, I think it's important to come to terms with the fact that that's not something that, that Jesus gave, but it's a, an interpretation that followers gave. Yeah. So with that, I think we should take just a really quick break, and we'll come back and we'll talk about what this means theologically for us today. Who Killed Jesus, a true crime podcast, was a special six-week exploration of who really killed Jesus and why. This podcast was brought to you by ProgressiveChristianity.org, celebrating 30 years of reclaiming Jesus' original message of justice, peace, and liberation while proclaiming an intellectually honest Christianity. And University Christian Church, San Diego, an authentic, inclusive, and progressive congregation in the heart of San Diego's Hillcrest neighborhood that declares God's love for all people. So we did ask about some lingering questions, and I think two lingering questions that came up from small group leaders that we heard about was, one, a follow-up on what we were just talking about, did Jesus die for our sins, and what does that mean theologically, and is Jesus divine? And I, I think those are two questions that small groups were really wrestling with, and different small groups came out to different answers, mm -hmm. I think. And so, um, you know, the whole notion of Jesus dying for our sins, I think I grew up, Marcella, not really questioning that very much, yeah. that that was just something that I heard in church, and I grew up in a progressive church, but I, I, I heard the language of that in the liturgy, and I, I, it was in the water that I drank in rural Missouri, <laughs> it just was something that people believed. Um, but the more that I studied it, the more I realized that that idea probably developed later. And for me, uh, that was transformative because instead of focusing then on belief about Jesus, it shifted my focus to following the message of Jesus mm -hmm. instead of believing the right things about him, trying to live my life emulating right. him. Right. Very similar to you. Uh, same. Grew up in Colorado Springs, which is like the heart of conservative Christianity these days. Um, and same, same idea, you know, like grew up really learning, but also feeling that, geez, no matter what I did, you know, I was sinful. I always had to pray to make sure I was forgiven for all my sins and all these little nitpicky things. And it really led to me questioning, like there was a lot of piety, like just a lot of religious piety. Um, do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this. Um, I was raised with very progressive um, parents, a progressive theologian that my dad is, but the church was very, very different. And um, it just never made sense to me. But then once I started studying, there was something that came up in my mind where dying for my sins feels good, right? It, it feels good in the sense of like, ah, oh, Jesus, you died for me to save me to, you know, because I'm a creature that needs saving, but it is much harder to step into the role of following Jesus the way that Jesus asks us to do. It is much harder to do justice and to love, like undoubtedly loving our enemies is much more difficult. It's great for me to think that somebody died for me to make me feel good, to make me look good, to make me, you know, this great creature, but it is much harder to really step into a role of justice. And that's where I land now, where following Jesus is hard because we're complicit day after day, especially living in a country like the United States. Um, we are complicit in a lot of what we do with the clothes that we wear, you know, who's, who's making that clothes, what children are making that clothes, who, with the, the stuff that we throw away, with, you know, like putting up a sign that says Black Lives Matter and going out to those marches is very hard because we know we're gonna be, you know, face, face challenges. That is much harder 
than to sit down and just thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins and making it all about me and a personal relationship with Jesus. So um, that's kind of where I've landed. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and I think maybe at this point, it's important to say that, you know, in our tradition, we believe in something called a responsible freedom of belief. And so sometimes people get a little bit confused about that, and they say, oh, well, you can believe whatever you want. And that's not actually true. We believe in a responsible freedom of belief. And so what that means is like a belief that's willing to dialogue, that's willing to, to discuss. And so I think no matter where you come out on, on some of these issues, it's okay, it's okay to come out in different places. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about this tradition is a willingness to be able to converse and, and discuss different different ways that we uh, that we might think about these things. Because yeah. the other truth of the matter is that both to that question and to this next one, that the Gospels present different, different. ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, so the next the next question is: Is Jesus divine? And I bet if I went and did a survey of people in the congregation, we would land all over the place. All over the on place, this. undoubtedly. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Because, because we have a responsible freedom of belief. And so I would say that in the Gospel of Mark, which we were reading for this podcast, that in the Gospel of Mark, we have a very low Christology. So Christology is how divine you think Jesus is. Because, uh, because I don't think the author of the Gospel of Mark thought that Jesus was divine. But the author of the Gospel of John, Most I think, definitely. did think Jesus was divine. Yeah. And so I, I think you get different, uh, different opinions about that in the Gospel. And I think we probably get different opinions about that here. And so I think that it's okay to land in different mm -hmm. places. I, I think it just can't affect how we live our lives. I think Definitely. that ultimately Jesus's message at the end of the day, whether you think he was uh, just fully human, whether you think he was fully divine, whether you think he was fully human, fully divine, because Christians have always been all over the map on that, right? Yeah. The, there, were, there were Jewish Christian adoptionists who thought Jesus was just a person, and there were Marcionite Christians who thought Jesus was so divine he only appeared to be here. <laughs> okay, so people have always been all over the map on that. But I think no matter where we land, it's important to do those things that Marshall was just talking about, which is living our lives in a way that emulates the life of Jesus. I have a quick question, though. Yeah. In 30 seconds, Kayla. <laughs> if Jesus, if somebody considers yeah. Jesus not divine, yeah. what makes him so special? Does that change our Christianity? If Jesus is not uh, divine... Yeah. What does that mean for us as Christians and Christianity as a whole? Because isn't yeah. the whole premise of Christianity that Jesus was divine? That's just a question. Yeah, so, I mean, this is something that I hear a whole lot, uh, especially in social media. And, no, I don't think that the whole premise of Christianity is that Jesus was divine. I, I actually don't think that Jesus taught that. So, you may have heard this before, but I think that after Jesus died, there was a fundamental switch from the religion of Jesus to the religion about Jesus. That Jesus talked primarily about the creation of the reign of God on earth, and then his disciples in turn talked primarily about him. And so when you get that movement, then, then there is a focus on on Jesus. Now, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. I think that what makes it, uh, 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 what marks us, I, I suppose, as true Jesus followers is not actually what we believe. So there's so much about orthodoxy in Christianity, believing the right thing. But I think perhaps there should be more focus on orthopraxy which is doing the right thing, living our lives as modeled by Jesus, which we can easily see, right? Loving our neighbor, practicing radical inclusion, opening the table, fighting for justice on behalf of those who are marginalized, that those are the things that Jesus talked about and did in his life. At the end of the day, I think that whether you believe Jesus is divine or not is not nearly as important as how you live your life. 
I agree. I fully agree. And this goes back to, as somebody who grew up in a very different denomination, there is a reason why I chose Disciples of Christ, and I'm glad that we're also part of the United Church of Christ, but here at University Christian Church, I intentionally wanted to join the Disciples of Christ because of the broad range of views, but also the acceptance and the dialogue that happens before the church denomination as a whole makes decisions. We have these conversations and there are clergy members having these conversations and we allow our congregations to have these con these ideas. And I think that's a really beautiful thing because I was tired of being told what to believe. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the same way that Marshall and I both have very low Christologies, um, that that also that we thank you for putting up with us and allowing us to extending us the grace to have those low theologies as i'm sure some of you have much higher christologies and and that that's all fine to exist in the same space that that's one of the beautiful things about this tradition is that we're all able to be in it together i think one more thing to say and then we ought to wrap up um because uh, you and i love to talk about this stuff and would for a long time is that the original ending of the Gospel of Mark is the ending that we heard last week, where there isn't an interpretation given to the empty tomb. And later editors came through and added the stuff that we heard today, where we see Jesus and get some post-Easter stories. I really like the original ending to the Gospel of Mark, because we don't get an answer. And I, I know that like a lot of religion has served to like give us answers, but at least for me, religion is more meaningful when it helps us to live the questions mm -hmm. than when it gives us easy answers. Mm -hmm. Because then the question becomes, where is Jesus? And as I said last week, I think we then get to answer with our lives, that, that we get to demonstrate where Jesus is. And if you come up with a different answer than that, then that's fine too. If you say, actually, I like this added stuff to Mark, or you say, actually, Mark's not the gospel for me. I really like John. Well, that's all fine too. But, but I think it's important to, to recognize that, that Mark's the earliest gospel, and so I think we get the earliest version of uh, theolo theology of resurrection in, in the gospel of Mark. I agree. Yeah. Any yeah. final thoughts, Marcella? No, just thank you for going on this journey with us. I, I learned a lot. I know that a bunch of you also had great uh, dialogue, and we appreciate le letting you, or entertaining us, you know, <laughs> allowing us to do this podcast during the past six weeks. Thank you, Marcella. Thank I had you. a great time. It was Me a too. lot of fun. It thank was. you all. It was. Well, friends, Thanks for letting us do this today. We know that the Sunday after Easter is always an interesting Sunday, and we thought this might be a little bit different than uh, just listening to a sermon. So thanks for letting us do that. And thank you for being here. If you're here today or you're watching online, you are a part of this church family. University Christian Church has said yes to you as God has said yes to you. If you'd like to say yes, University Christian Church is my church home as well. We invite you to come forward during our final hymn. Friends, let's stand up and let's sing together.
<laughs> I love that. Thank you all. Thank you, music leaders. We appreciate all of you. Glad all of you were here today. Don't forget to join us for Coffee Chat out those doors to your right as you're leaving in the courtyard. Friends, as we go forth from this place, may we go forth proclaiming that Christ lives and he lives through each one of us. May we go forth ready to proclaim Jesus' life out in the world by living our lives seeking justice, mercy, and peace. May it be so. Amen.